Finally, an RC train with real working valve gear. I know you've probably come from other videos that have quote unquote working valve gear, but they aren't, at least not fully. In order to have fully working valve gear, you need a rod that determines if the train's valve gear will drive it forwards or backwards. Like this one. This type of valve gear is called valve shirts, I think, German originally. And it makes use of an eccentric here, driving this long banana shaped link here, and by varying the leverage ratio here, creates a valve gear that goes forwards and backwards. Here's the valve, here is the piston. And this bit down here sort of extends the valve. Think of it as a lumpy cam in a race car. It makes it more on and off, and just generally makes it smoother. And it has been modified with Gresley conjugation, which are these levers here, and use the outside cylinders to drive the middle one without any valve gear on the inside. This is actually a terrible idea, and we'll see why later. Specifically, this valve gear is meant to drive piston valves. I mean, they're not really in here, but that's what it's meant to do. And you can quickly tell at a glance, without you know running it through in your mind, by if this pivot point is above the valve, it's piston valve. If it's below, it's sleeve valve, because they are in effect reversed. And unfortunately, Lego isn't very scale, and because I wanted to keep the Lego joints, I've had to keep it out of scale. So to cut down on the size and complexity, although not really, I guess, I've added more sliding mechanisms than there would otherwise be. Well, this one and this one. But this one was actually done because if you have a lever here, its path is never going to be four straight. It's always going to have a slight curve to it. And this makes the forwards and reverse running slightly different. And because you always optimise to fur, uh, forwards, you can't really reverse so well. And during late steam, when they really wanted to get rid of turntables, some trains did move to this mechanism because it allowed for better reversing. General shunting engines had this much earlier on. But this? Total fabrication. Never seen it. Terrible idea. I just did it because it works in Lego. Here is a running live steam engine. Well, it has its boiler on it. And here's the links I talked about. The ones that mine is, well, I would say missing, but optimised out, I should say. This one here and this one here. Whoop, whoop. Quick aside, these wheels, and in fact this whole thing, was originally meant to be for an airy triplex. That's what these wheels are sized for. And they use a different type of valve gear, which does not use this, well, banana link. It's something called Baker valve gear, which uses just joints. And funnily enough, I did actually get it to work, but it was far too big and just a bit ungainly. So, no airy triplex, but functional. Originally, he had planned to get this mechanism to work with a separate motor, or servo, driving this link for added realism. But there isn't really space for that in this LEGO train. Because, well, LEGO track is fabulously tight. Real train of this scale would be about a ten foot circle. LEGO? About half a metre. So that's why it's got this whole super deformed look. Sorry. But, in order to fit this mechanism in, it is actually driven by the drive motor via a differential. And that's what powers this. The power must first go through this mechanism, and since this is so much easier to move than the wheels, it moves and gives authentic valve movement without the need for a separate motor. Now onto the conjugation. The conjugation is a way of getting, well, three cylinders, one, two, and then one in the side, pointing down slightly, to work with just valve gear on the outsides. Why do you need three? It's not for power. I mean, kind of can be, but it's more to even out the torque. You see, a piston doesn't equally produce torque throughout its entire rotation. Naturally, it produces zero at the dead stroke, and then increases into its mid stroke. And normal trains with two cylinders are 90 degree opposed. And this causes a very lumpy torque curve. No different to a car, but you see, a car has lots of gears, prop shafts, and nice soft tyres to sort of even out, and not to mention tyres have way more grip than metal wheels or metal tracks. So if your torque curve peaks, but its troughs are, say, 80% of the peak, 
then you can only pull away, really, at about 80% power, because any more, and the peaks, would cause the wheels to spin, even though at the lower peaks they wouldn't be. And to make long story short, if you have three cylinders, it allows for a small, smoother torque curve, and allows you to accelerate faster. And when steam was still realistically competing with diesel and electric, this was a really good idea. Except not with this mechanism. Up until now, this mechanism seems like a great idea. Less complexity, same effect. And no. Now, you see, these cylinders operate at 120 degrees from each other. And this mechanism provides that. And it does so via connecting all the control rods from both sides. Now, it's important to make at this point that steam trains really rely on nice, stiff couplings. Incredibly stiff. And because they drive in both directions, there can be no backlash. Okay, maintaining this, super important. It's what makes the train drive, and when they don't, it's generally this. But the problem is, if you connect the two together, while you've only added a few joints, again, this is slightly optimised for LEGO, you're actually connecting them both, which means the inaccuracies from both affect the middle cylinder. So in real terms, the tolerances in the valve gear on the sides has to be more than double for the centre to have the same accuracy as the outer ones, which is absurd. Modern day, this probably wouldn't be a problem, but historically, whenever these trains didn't get perfect maintenance, when World War II rolled around, or when the Americans wanted it for some reason, it was terrible. The first seat, um, middle cylinder would always struggle. And I think there are more non-running Lifesteam conjugated engines than any other, simply because it is such a pain. How tuning it, making it structural, it's all just a really odd pain. And it's difficult to state how much of a problem this was. The second the guy that came up with this, Gresley, left, his replacement got rid of it on the entire circuit. Just got rid of them. Never did another train like it. Completely got rid of them. So, oh, and if you're wondering why I've done it, it looks cool, doesn't it? Also, it's what Flying Scotsman and Mallard had. They were both Gresley engines. So, oh, an interesting fact, those two trains have three cylinders, and quite often in a the film, they'll be dubbed over with just stock steam sound, with two cylinders, which would be a four-note puffing sound. So, no, it's real, there'll be a six-note chuffing sound, which is what this engine would theoretically produce. Later on, sort of near the dying end of steam, three-cylinder trains just had this entire mechanism duplicated on the inside, so many more pieces, and engineers didn't like getting up inside there, but it was just a better mechanism for everyone. Although you'll find a lot of the end of steam stuff doesn't bother, because by that point in time, electrals and diesels were just so much better in terms of acceleration, and it just wasn't worth it, and most of them were consigned to freight duty, where acceleration didn't really matter. Since I like to procrastinate, I also gave this train suspension. You can just see the coil in there. Here is the limiter for the valve gear, and this is how the wheels are driven, by this front via a bevel gear. And, as we can see here, it does in fact have real, usable suspension. Hopefully you found this fun, certainly took enough interest, but my I don't think I'm going to do the triplex, it's too big, it'd be like better part of a metre long, but I have got a 9F project strangely modified but the next video probably because it's got cold now is i've got a lego t-gauge train only very slightly bigger about 1 360th scale that runs goes around a figure of eight or oval i should say goes into a siding goes over a bridge with elevation change in a um carriage hope to put it on lego ideas and that's gonna be the next project well it's finished i mean record it